Hi, and welcome to the More Confidence with Luna Gaia podcast. I'm your host, Luna Gaia, and here we talk all things self-esteem, body positivity, mental health, wellness, how to get out of those bloody thoughts of self-doubt in your mind and actually live a life that is true and free to be you. Sometimes it's just me, and at other times, like today, we have incredible guests here to be able to share their wisdom, their knowledge, their stories, to be able to help you to overcome your self-doubt and be all of yourself. And I am so pleased to introduce to the More Confidence with the Lunar Guy podcast today, Catherine Nolan. She is the founder of Gender Gap Gone and the Don't Be Asked movement. I'm so excited to hear about this, by the way. With a global reputation as a women's leadership expert, she's partnered with ASX Top One, Top 10, Fortune Top 10, Top 50 companies like Coca-Cola, Toyota, Uber, Disney, Johnson & Johnson, numerous government departments and many more empowering empowering places, empowering people to see their strengths and leverage them. Having won awards for leadership and women will change the world, Catherine is a two-time number one best-selling author, regularly seen in discussions with celebrity women's advocates and leaders on how we can see the gender gap gone, as if this isn't an incredibly important topic, and I'm just, I'm pumped to be able to have this conversation. She's an ex-corporate girl with 20 years of executive coaching expertise and three young kids. Life then delivered her a knock so big it nearly ended her. Fighting back from that with the kids in tow delivered transformational insights and tools that thousands of clients have since implemented and loved too. Never far from water, Catherine lives in Sydney with her partner Sam, with five kids age eight and up, busy life, and mini Groodle Pup Bronte between them. Life is full. Working globally from this blissfully chaotic base, her mission is to help you build a life of joy and impact with all the rewards that you deserve. Please welcome to the More Confidence with Luna Guy podcast, Catherine Ollum. Thank you so much. I am just absolutely beyond chuffed to be here. I feel as though, um, Luna, we've spoken a few times and I just, I love your energy. I love your lines. I love your lines. And I'm, I feel as though I'm, um, I know, you know, we're here to have a chat, but I actually am excited to learn. So yeah. every time I hear from you, I learn. So I'm, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to soak it up. May, may we all learn, huh? I think that that's, totally. I think that's the beautiful thing that, that I want everybody watching and listening at home to really understand that, that if, if you're looking at any leader, if you're looking at any quote guru or person that you look up to, know that the reason why they get to do what they do, why you and I get to be leaders is because we're continually learning. Oh, for sure. From others, from each other. It's, it's not, it, to me, and shout out to everyone there, if you have ever if you ever are going to give money to somebody to help you get further in life and they tell you that they have all the answers and that they're not learning anymore, run. Run fast in the other direction as far as you can go because you're either green and growing or ripe and rotting. Keep mm -hmm. growing, everybody. Keep learning. So it's tell me, true. tell me, Kat, how, how are you here? An ex-corporate girl, what was that moment? I mean, I'm so curious. There's so many things in your bio that I want to know about. <laughs> how did you get to here a two times number one best-selling author ex-corporate girl now doing massive things to be able to get the gender gap gone and teach people how not to be asked which is an acronym by the way everybody and we're going to like that yeah. it is do you know what there's kind of been um I think with any journey there's milestones along the journey right so totally ex-corporate girl um you know worked with some of the biggest uh brand names in the in the world worked globally um, and I loved doing that. I loved helping organisations to make sure they had the, the right talent in the right places and help them to, you know, get the talent to where that needed to be, that they could really um, pursue the corporate goals and the corporate vision. And that was awesome. Yeah, nice. But there were parts of it that were just killing me, you know. Yeah. Um, it was this mask that I had to wear that, you know, like working in leadership, in corporate leadership, in the space that I worked in, there were not very many boobs at the top. Oh, so, oh. Nobody talked about kids. Nobody talked about mental health. And at the time, I didn't have kids either. Okay, and yeah. I was, you know, I, I know you talk about the good girl. I was very much the good girl. Yeah. And so, you know, like um, I'm also very tuned into other people. And so I knew what was required to do well in that environment. And I could, you know, if I didn't get to talk about the personal stuff, no problem. That's fine. But it was fine for a short time. Not because you were really good at 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 the role 
And when I say the role, it's not just the role in terms of the the position description that was on the the contract that you signed. Mm. It was the facade of the role, which very often often happens to people, particularly in a corporate environment. There's this person that they have to become in order to succeed, and particularly particularly women, like you needed to play the role of you don't have boobs, you don't have a uterus, you you don't have the empathy, <laughs> you don't have empathy, you just are, are, the, are the hard ass. Is that kind of what it was like for you? Very much, yeah. And not every environment that I worked in, and there were certainly some exceptions to that who were divine, but um, yeah, definitely that was very, very much it. And I remember coming home one day and just saying, you know, like, I just, you know, I'll just try hard. Like another month, another month. And my husband at the time said, um, he's like, it's not going to change. Just pull the pin now. So I went into business on my own um, so that I could work with my own clients and started to work um, in corporate coaching at the same time. So I stayed with the business that for a few days a week so I could get sort of um, some really big hours of corporate coaching under my belt, which was phenomenal. (laughs) Um, And I started my own gig. But it wasn't until 2015 that I decided to sort of niche down and just work with women because that's where I really enjoyed working and because it was where I felt we could get the biggest turnaround because I found that, you know, men and women just operate differently. When we're talking about our professional development, we just operate differently, you know, like Mm -hmm. the guys would have a coaching call and this was like a, you know, like a $10,000 coaching program that the organisation had provided. This was, the the, you know, that all they had to do was show up, just show up and execute, that's it. Yeah. The guys would show up every time, every time. In fact, I can remember the one time that someone didn't show up um, across a, you know, sort of four year period. I remember the one time that someone didn't show up and it was um, like there was an emergency that he had to reschedule. For. Yeah, right. But yeah. otherwise they, they showed up yes. Whereas the women. For the women in corporate coaching programs, the women who I was working with, the executives who I was working with, it was almost like a gym membership. You know, like yeah. having the corporate coaching program, they kind of felt like they were doing the bit that they were supposed to do, filling the obligation. But if something came up at work, that came first. Wow. If there was a fire they had to put out at work. They dealt with the fire. They didn't delegate the fire because coaching was something for them and oh, not for the business. Yes. So they put the business first every time. Every time. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And that is something that I, I feel... I- that women are bred to do totally to put, to put other people's needs first where yeah. you know it's, it's part of our culture that it is just well you come last in, in every context in the context of the family in context of the business in context or whatever yes if there's time to get to you then maybe we will yes but probably not yes yes wow what an amazing what an amazing observation to make that the yeah. women cancelled regularly because work was yeah. more important yeah this absolutely. was work this totally, was- this is work. Absolutely. Because yeah. your professional development helps your organisation as well as your own career. Your own career helps those who follow you, those who rely on you. Mm. And then the other thing was that in terms of the career stuff, so that's the development stuff, but the career stuff, just the way that men and women think differently about their careers is phenomenal. And it's not just about how they think about their careers. It's, you know, like um, I found that men go to work Women go to work to meet the boss's KPIs, right? So they're thinking right. about what they need to deliver. And, mm-hmm. of course, men go to work for that as well. Yeah. But they've also got their own career on their on their radar as well. So yeah. I think they have a much better ability to say no to things yep. if it doesn't suit their path as well as mm-hmm. the organisation's path. And so there are a whole lot of little nuances like this. And, you know, the fact that um, that confidence gap is so enormous for women. There's this one question that I've been asking, and I've been doing a lot of guest speaking over the last how many years, um, and whether it's the one-on-one coaching or the guest speaking, there's this one question that I keep asking, and that's the, what is the one thing that's holding you back from taking the next step? And nine and a half out of 10, the half a person out of 10 says, nothing's holding me back. I'm five years off retirement. I say what I want. I get what I want. I do what I want. Yeah. Awesome. Good for you. Yeah. How do we get that into the other nine and a half? half because yeah. the other nine and a half out of 10 are all saying, it's a version of confidence. It's imposter syndrome. It's courage. It's I don't think that I can do the job or um, I've seen what success looks like. That doesn't look like me. They wouldn't want me to do it my way. Therefore, I'm not yes. going for the job. Wow. 
So it's all these versions of courage. And so that's where yeah. Don't Be Asked came from. It's the don't be at risk of self-doubt. Don't risk it. You've, so you've at got risk this. of self-doubt for everybody. Yeah. That's the acronym. At risk of self-doubt. Don't be asked. Don't be at it risk is. of self-doubt. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm like, I'm so, um, like my natural style is quite pragmatic. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm incredibly people centered, but I'm very pragmatic. And so Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of the empty rah-rah because it's so superficial and passing, you know, like it's just fleeting and it can make you feel great or it can actually make you feel worse depending on where you're at. But so for me, it's got to be, it's got to be grounded in practical stuff. You know, you've got to have evidence for it. You've got to have this. Amen body of stuff to lean on to argue with yourself yes because uh, and and the way that I see that for me very often in my work it's very similar I need your feet on the ground with your head in the clouds yes totally I want want you to be the tree Uh I need to be rooted I need you really solid I I need your roots really deep down so your foundations are really strong yeah and, and deep and down so that means that you know that big things can happen to your branches and you can sway for flexibility because if we're stagnant, if we're tight, we break. Mm. If you don't bend, you break, right? So totally. it's nice to have the flexibility of the of, of the, be the bamboo branches. Right? Yeah. Yes. But with a really solid trunk. Yeah. And yeah. to me, that's around going, cool. The how I get there doesn't matter. Yeah. But but I'm getting there. And yes. I think you're right. It's well, I know that you're right, actually. I know that you're right. There are countless women that I work with in a completely different context, of course. Mm. But the same thing rings true. It's exactly the same. Mm. I'm not that person. Mm. I couldn't do that. Or even, yes. even in the context of, you know, and I want to know your, your thoughts around this. In our culture, certainly ours, and I, 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 ours in terms of Australia and Western culture, men are very comfortable taking up space. Mm. and they're very comfortable speaking their mind and their voice even when they're wrong right mm. even when totally even when, they're, when they're arrogant even when it's even when it's even when it's obnoxious mm. there is there is very little breeding into them that they should keep their mouth shut mm. yet for generations and generations women have been told to keep their mouth shut Mm. so how does that play out how, how did you watch that play out with women mm. who had amazing things to say or mm. shitty things to say irrelevant but just wouldn't mm. wouldn't use their voice how often mm. does that happen and and how do you see that like why why does why do you think in your experience that has played out in yeah, why is that yeah. Playing out in the world? all right I'm gonna I'm gonna walk you through an example and then Thank I'm you. gonna walk you through why I think that happens so um To take a really narrow example, um, I would have, um, so at one point I was recruiting for, for a few years, I was recruiting for executive finance level and general management type roles, right? So I was recruiting for like head of finance, like really big roles as head of finance, CFO type roles. To be honest, one resume looks pretty much the same as the next resume. They're all very similar. They've had very similar experience. They've been through similar um, uh, educational so they've got similar qualifications, similar experience. They look very similar. Yeah. I'll pay and by. yet yeah. when people called about the role, about the job ad, so we'd be advertising globally. This is not just a local thing. Advertising globally. People would call about the role, the ad, job ads, and the guys would call and they would say, hey, I'm calling about the role. How much are you paying? Yes. <laughs> and if I was paying, if they were paying 250K for this role, they would assume that that's the starting point for the negotiation so that they would get the role, get the offer, and then negotiate their way to 350K. Yeah, right. Women uh, didn't talk about salary at all. Women would call and say, hi, I'm calling about, remember they had the same experience, the same resume. Yes. Yeah. They would call and they would say, hey, I'm calling about the role. I don't actually have X, Y, and Z. Can I still apply? Oh, my gosh. These are $250,000 senior executive people. That we would assume, and and for you know, there, there's an assumption that those women mm. who are at the top of their game, you yeah. know, that like to me, oh, like they you're, are. You, you, totally. you're at the top, man, you're, you're applying for CFO positions. Yeah, we there's an assumption of people who aren't in that kind of bracket to go. Mm. Well, of course they're completely confident and absolutely secure within themselves. Yet the first thing that they're asking you or telling you is all the things that they're not. Totally. Because that's what we're thinking about. That's what our minds are filled with. There's this another, there's this activity that I do with people where I sit down and ask them to basically fill a page, right? So we sort of put some lines across the page and break up the page into what they're good at. And this is in one of the, in the um, Don't Be Asked book as well, where 
like just sort of put a grid on the page. So just sort of, mm. you know, horizontal or vertical line and just jot down if you've got the left-hand side is what I'm great at and the right-hand side is what I'm not so good at. Mm -hmm. And above the line is the things that you love to do. Below the line are the things that you've maybe outgrown. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people will put out there, um, I'm totally going off track for your question, but a lot of people will put out there what uh -huh. all the things they're good at because of their lack of courage. Yes. And so it means they end up doing these jobs that are at the bottom of the list, at the bottom of yeah. the page, the things that they've outgrown, but they're so um, lacking confidence that they're putting it all out there yep. and getting stuck in jobs that they've outgrown, getting stuck in jobs that they don't want to do anymore. Because it's the only place that they're confident. Because, totally. because what I'm hearing here, Kath, and I hope it doesn't derail your train of thought here, very often, and maybe for women, competence mm. is what, what gives us confidence. Competence. Like we need to feel competent in it in yeah. order to feel confident. That's not necessarily true totally. for other people. Totally. And the big challenge with this is that because we are culturally um, ingrained to be so humble, mm. when I give this task to men and women, the difference, honestly, you could draw a line down the room with how people respond differently oh, wow. so this piece of paper an oh. innocent piece of paper yeah walking around a room I remember doing this so clearly with a group of um, um it was a group of agriculture a group of people a group of leaders within the agriculture sector mm -hmm. and <laughs> I did it again with uber mm -hmm. and you know, like I said completely really diverse demographics I've done it again with a global audience across um, Asian and European countries and the US and Australia. Mm -hmm. The same thing happens time and time again. It doesn't matter the age, the demographics, no, no, it always happens. The men have the side of the skills that they've got populated. Yep. They don't go near the other side. The gaps is empty because it's not on their radar. Yeah, but the right. women have nothing on the, on the skills. They've got like maybe there might be one little thing I'm good with people. But the other side, the gaps, the weaknesses, oh, they go to town. Yes, they know it so well. They do. And I don't know if you find the same thing when you start coaching somebody, but often women will come to a coaching session and at the start of it they'll say, okay, I know what my weaknesses are. I've worked on this and this and this in the past and I've done, yep. so, I've done okay. I've imposed oh, yeah. those gaps. I've done well. But these are the gaps that I need to work on now. Well aware, well aware totally. at every single floor. Yes. That possibly could have ever happened, you know, dating back to when you were in, in year eight and that person yes. said that thing to you about that test score that you had, like <laughs> that keeps them up at three o'clock in the morning sometimes. Totally. Oh, God, have I only said that thing? Like how yeah. we're, we're obsessed. I think we're obsessed yeah. by everything that we lack. It's so challenging because I think that um, the assumption is that we, I think we, a lot of us have had this sense that it's like an onion, right? So that thing that was said to you when you're eight, that's like the inner layer of the onion. And then you have a partner who's not so respectful and that goes another layer. And then yeah. somebody else in there, you know, um, attempts to be kind, maybe slips up, says it the wrong way, whatever, and it goes another yeah. layer on top of that. And so we have all of these layers, you know, it might be something in the media that says that you're supposed to look this way in order to be accepted and that's another layer because I don't look this way I don't think I look this way and oh my god I, I need to come back to that one even sometimes like wearing that pencil skirt like like totally. for me, I've, I've not spent a lot of time in corporate at all but the, the idea I can see myself in the past the idea yeah. of that of like well I don't really I don't really wear pencil skirt and yeah. and and heels I, I don't dress that way so therefore yeah. I couldn't even be in that world irrelevant yeah. of my skills yeah I just couldn't wear a pencil skirt Yes. Like that would be the thing in the past that perhaps would have held me back yeah. going into a corporate job because yeah. I don't want to wear pumps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. But the really interesting thing for me, this was a like a just a extraordinary moment when I learned. So the latest research, Luna, it's showing us that like I think our perception, I ask people this all the time and they say, like, where did your, where did your bias come from? You know, these, these, your perceptions around yourself, your perceptions around mm -hmm. your self-belief around who you are, what value you offer and where you fit in. Where does it come from? Yeah. And they'll list off things like the media, like mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the high school influencers, their colleagues, yeah. their friends, their peers, their loving partners, all of those places. But actually the latest research is showing that it's, four generations we carry with us four oh, generations of bias yes was it four you? generations was it you that posted about this recently i think i remember Might have seeing, done. seeing something in Might terms of yeah. the wound in which we carry is yeah. 
from four generations ago at the it's very crazy least. right yeah it's crazy so like if you think back four generations ago in a in a work sense um you know how do you show up in the world and how do you um how do you appease your need for financial security if i think back four generations ago my great grandmother yeah you know the way that she got ahead was to be attractive and um you know to be agreeable and subservient like totally. and, and sub- completely submissive yes. and really even then if you think about then four generations ago even even three and in yes. in or even two generations ago as well yeah. money wasn't even didn't even belong to women mm. There's a piece that I talk about in in my book and as as well in in one of my courses around. I cannot region. wait to read this book. By the way, just I have to shout over you. I cannot wait to read this book. I'm so excited. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. Friday, Sorry. two days. I hope I haven't derailed. I know it's it's totally counting down. Well, it's for those of you actually watching today, it's yeah. today because ah. because you know we're recording this in the past Yay. and you're watching it today on Friday. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I real I really appreciate it. There's this this piece that I'm talking to about why we hate our bodies, and it's really yeah. interesting because that's a lot of the work that I do. People come to me because they hate their bodies, but that's mm. not that's not the problem that I solve. Mm. <laughs> because they don't hate their bodies because of the way that their bodies look. You hate your body because of the way that you think, and it's rooted in low self esteem. Yes, and it's rooted in generational yes. um, it, conditioning and programming. For sure, one hundred percent, and and something that I speak to that that our mothers and our mothers' mothers, if you think about this, our bodies actually didn't belong to us. Mm. Like actually, mm-hmm. marriage, the, 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 the foundations of marriage to how we know it now, maybe not in pagan times, but how we know marriage now, a dowry was given and your father walked you down the aisle to give you away. And when we think about that kind of language, language creates our reality. If you it use does. that kind of language and think about that actual act, people think that that's lovely, but the yeah. reality is what that actually was indicated was one man owned you, your father, as mm-hmm. a woman, and then he passes on ownership yes. to the husband. Yes. And, and, and then very often in a lot of cultures still there's a dowry that's paid that mm-hmm. you literally pay for that woman. You're, you're paying for that woman and now she totally. belongs to you. And totally. still we live in a culture, and maybe not in our society, thank goodness, but but certainly in many, many cultures around the world, and trigger warning for anybody here, I'm about to talk about some heavy shit. Um, marital rape is still legal in many, many countries around the world because women belong to men. Women are the, yeah. are the objects of men. We are there to serve. And I say we, and I'm speaking in the first tense now because if we as women in this generation have not healed that wound, if we have not gone back and done the work to liberate ourselves, to become sovereign with our own beings and reclaim our bodies and ourselves as ours, mm. then we are still running a pattern. Mm. So I, I found for myself that in my, in my relationship with, with a man, 10-year relationship with a man, I automatically did the lion's share of the housework. Mm. And it's not because he was oppressing me. It's not because he refused to do it or expected that Mm. I did, but I modelled what happened in my household. Mm. My mum worked a full-time job, raised five children and kept the entire six-bedroom house that we were very blessed to have spotless. Mm. And it was her job to, and raise the children, that was was her job. Dad's Mm. job was to go to work and keep the lawns neat. (laughs) Yeah. And to be revered. And, and, you know, his dinner came in on a tray every night because he was tired at the end of the day. Yeah. And my mum was just flogged. And, and that's, that was normal for her. That's what was normal for me. I was the mm. only, I'm the youngest of five um, and they're all boys. So yeah. all I had modelled was my mum and that's watching this. And we go back those generations, our bodies didn't, didn't belong to us. When we have a look at the media, we look at the media and the only time women are a, are, are projected and it's changing now, which is excellent. The only time women are projected is from a sense of objectification. We mm. see them on the billboard as the object of someone's sexual desire. Mm. The fact that you can have tits out on a on a magazine cover, but you know, a lot of breastfeeding places, mm. tells me that I'm only allowed to be a being if it mm. serves someone else. Mm. And I think this plays so heavily into what you're saying because. If we do not undo those four or five generations, the many generations, 
it's still playing out for us now. Mm. We might think, and we do, we, we live in a world where women have a lot more rights, but the fact that the matter is is that we still play this out. Mm. And, yes, there is still a, gender, there's still a gender pay gap, but we're playing it out as well because we're not, mm. we're not speaking our truth. We're not saying up. We're not taking up space and, honestly, pissing people off because mm. in workspaces and in many spaces, men are really fine to piss people off. Mm by saying the wrong thing. Women have been taught because we're owned by someone else. We don't want to embarrass our father. We don't want to embarrass our husband. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was, um, Luna, there was this, um, I know you say globally that there's places globally where rape is still legal in a marriage. It's actually, it's only in the 70s in Australia, in a lot of places that it was made illegal. But I remember going to this um, gallery with my kids in Northern England, in Newcastle in Northern England a couple of years ago, and there was this exhibition. It was fabulous. It was, um, and there was this one room in this exhibition. So I went with my kids and my aunt, my uncle, and we go into this room and it was this exhibition on feminism. And this, the whole point of this, in fact I'll wait so we go into this room right Mm -hmm. and this whole wall like a huge big wall in in a gallery space this enormous big wall is just filled with different versions of boobs oh I love it like you know like um uh pop art type images that are like almost looks like a fried egg and there's just so many different versions of different images of boobs yeah and we're sitting in this room and my son at the time was so he must he was 10 right uh, yeah, 10, 9 or 10. And so, and he's sitting in the middle of this room and, like, they love galleries. Mm-hmm. So this wasn't, it, it didn't occur to me that this would be anything strange because we're in galleries a fair bit. It's art. Right? Yeah. Totally it's art. And so he's sitting in this room and I'm like, I looked across and he had this sort of weird kind of cheek, kind of like half trying to smile but half a bit embarrassed. I wasn't quite sure whether he should laugh out loud or, you know, cringe. And I'm like, um, are you all right? And then my daughter sitting next to him was two years younger. And I said to her, what do you think this is about? What do you think this exhibition is about? Um, And and each of them, then my youngest, who was probably five at the time, and she's like, I think it's about how to grow your boobies. (laughs) (laughs) So we had this fantastic conversation then about the fact that actually, no. So the reason that this exhibition is here is because it's showing that in galleries around the world, um, women are often the object of the art, yes. but female artists are not represented. Yes. And so, you know, there's there's messages all over the place and there's a lot of work that's being done, which is awesome. Mm. But I think that um, the real telltale sign of whether we've made progress, and for me the gender gap, it's about the pay gap, but it's so much more than that. Yeah, so you're right. The pay yep. gap is almost just the, it's the pointy end, it's the bit you can measure. But the yeah, it's the scab. It's 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 the really? it's the tip of the iceberg, as you said. It's, it's absolutely. It's, it's the symptom of a much more insidious cur- like cause. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I think where you see where we can see that there's progress, and one of the biggest challenges for me, I think that we're making progress in media, mm-hmm. but I think. And one of the reasons, so Australia, in terms of the gender gap globally, the World Economic Forum puts Australia, I think we're currently at about 35 in the world, 36 okay. in the world, which is crazy, yeah. crazy. Yeah. Um, and on some of our measures, we're actually 110th in the world. So, and they measure things like political, um, your political standing for women in the country and economic standing and health mm-hmm. outcomes mm-hmm. So those, and education. So education, we do really well, but some of the others were terrible. Yeah, right. And then if you look at our politics in Australia, so, you know, the media representation, I think we're gaining some ground there. We're mm-hmm. gaining some ground. You know, there's some of the language around, you know, like, for example, when rape happens, yeah, it's actually starting to be reported in a more... Um, it's not as victim blaming. Yes, but when, and when it is politics, victim blaming, it gets called out against it. It you does. Know, it, yeah, it's like you, you don't. We don't talk about that. We don't say that anymore. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Mm. There was a few years ago. I don't know if you remember Eddie McGuire um, had uh, some comments. So he was on radio and he oh. made some comments about Adam Goods, and they were dreadful comments. And yes, I remember was, that. Yeah. 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 And he was cut down for them, and thank God he was cut down for them. And I think that. And I'm not saying there was certainly a lot of backlash that was supporting him and that's terrible. Mm. But the fact that we had such a large outpouring of support for Adam Goods, that kind of tells me that we're making progress on that. You know, like as a culture, as a Mm -hmm. society, there are 
a growing number of people who are saying that's not okay. We've yep. moved on, buddy, catch up. Yes. Yep. But when it comes to gender, we're just not there yet, especially yeah. workplace gender stuff. Mm-hmm. Workplace gender stuff. When you've got, you know, um, the the terrible issues that have happened in Parliament, oh like my gosh. literally in Parliament House, and yep. you've got our Prime Minister saying, well, we know these things happen. But, like, you know, part, part, part of the course, you know, if you're going uh, to be a woman wearing a skirt in, in, a, in a man's world, what, what do you expect? Totally, totally. So the fact that this is the commentary that's coming from our head of state yeah, and that, you know, like incident after incident after incident happens and it's just not being dealt with in a way that's respectful of women moving forward, yep. then I think that we just do. We just keep embedding this culture. We yeah. keep embedding this culture. Yes, because because then women continue to have a look at, at what happened. I can't remember the the woman's name, um, who was very much public in the media last last year. She, you know, she was just dismissed and dismissed and dismissed, and then moved mm-hmm. and then had to leave her job. Because mm-hmm. she was so bullied to the point. So then yeah. what message that sends other women who are experiencing maybe just discrimination, I say yes. just, maybe, you know, discrimination or harassment, not, yes. not even rape, right, yes. not even to that extent, they go, what's the point? Totally. Uh, it, it, becomes, it becomes apathetic. You go, well, it's just, it's just part of living in a man's world. Totally. And, you know, there's... Um... I feel as though we're going way deeper than maybe you were anticipating Fabulous. this conversation. I okay, good. And like, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So there's this thing um, that's a barrier for Australian women that just doesn't happen around the world. So, you know, we had like the global movement, the, U- the Me Too Me movement too. globally. Mm. It just didn't take off here. And it's not because it has nothing to do with the fact that it's, it doesn't correlate to the number of incidents at all. Okay. Yeah. It's because of our gag laws. So in Australia, we have these defamation laws that mean that if you do something to me, I can't actually say that you've done that to me. So, you know, like Grace Tame is the Australian of the Year. I was speaking yeah. with her a couple of months ago and, yeah. you know, she was she's the Australian of the Year because she's a phenomenal change maker in yep. getting the gag laws lifted yeah, right. around child sexual assault in Tasmania, just in Tasmania. And she managed to do that. The reason that she did that was because her perpetrator, who had been convicted, was all over Facebook bragging about his conquests. And she was not allowed to say her name and her story in the same place at the same time. Oh, Cass. It's horrendous, right? Oh. So Grace managed to change the, get the laws changed for Tasmania. So those gag laws around that issue have been changed. They've not changed for domestic violence they've not changed for any other kind of assault they've not changed across the rest of Australia but she was absolutely instrumental in getting that process started so she's phenomenal she's a phenomenal human that is amazing because when the policy when the poll when government policy Mm. it that's it's it's a communication tool you are communicating with me where my stand in society totally yeah and when the policy does not align with Mm. you know it's it's the fact that we only had gay marriage recently, you totally. know, it's it, because the policy then stipulates that you are not okay by us. Totally. We don't believe you. We think that we're going to, we're going to make it look, it's just performative. If the policy doesn't change, it's just performative. It's yep. just you giving, quote, us a breadcrumb to keep yeah. us quiet. For just, sure. Just sure to keep you quiet, but the policy is still going to support the perpetrators when Absolutely. that is still in place, when rapists are still getting very, very short sentences and when they are mm. being portrayed in the media as, you know, great guy turns bad or great guy yeah, does absolutely. something bad. Yeah. No, he's a murderer. Totally. And until we, until the policy gets changed, and I know it, I know that policy doesn't necessarily change culture and culture doesn't necessarily change po- policy, but as much as we need as both, right? Changes, we need both. Yeah. And, and there's a beautiful line in Macklemore's song, yeah. um, Same Love, and, and he says, he goes, no law is going to change us, but it's a damn good place to start. Oh, so true. So and it's true. like because if we do not trust that, that the policymakers, that the government has our back, mm. then we sit there and go, cool, we might get all the change that we want to culturally and mm. people might stand up for it. But if the big dogs at the top still think that I'm a piece of shit and that they don't trust me mm-hmm. and that they're not will and that I have to be gagged but mm. the perpetrator gets to 
brag as much as they want. Mm-hmm. It just leads to apathy. It leads to mistrust and it leads, it just, the, the gap continues to stay. We cannot bridge that because it requires policy in order for us to actually bridge it. It really does. Luna, I think about your, um, I love your concept of the shark nets. That, you know, yeah. with a shark net in place, we will actually swim out a lot further than we would if there's no shark net. Yeah. And I think that um, where we're at at the moment is we've got a lot of people who are trying to create a movement that creates change for women and, and creates genuine equality. Yeah. Um, and not just for women, but women's a good place to start, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, because it's a larger number, you get bigger mass behind it, and then we start to mm-hmm. think about how you can change things for individuals not just for a type of person yeah but so when you have you know this this shark net when you have um you know this this our expectations of how big and scary is the world mm. what are the protections in place for women yep and we look at the shark nets well there's shark nets in place there's laws that protect us you know you can't rape me that's it's against the law yes yep and there's a shark net there i can see the shark nets there it's the law that's yep. the shark net yeah but actually if the shark net is just like a floaty thing on top but there's nothing down the bottom like in Queensland for example just on the rape one that you mentioned in Queensland the penalties for rape in Queensland are extremely harsh they're close to the death like close to homicide level penalties yeah yep but unfortunately that has meant that people are very scared to um convict people of rape yeah right like even judges like like the 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 system the judges are uh, system yeah because because they view it as too harsh yeah yeah and so all the guy has to say is i didn't know she wanted it and the case goes away sorry i didn't know she didn't know she didn't want it yeah 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 Yeah. i didn't know she didn't want it Yeah. yeah and it goes away and to be really frank i've had the same experience happen with me the same experience happened with me um yeah yeah. And yes. and again, like those gag laws. So I, I don't know if you can see my face. I'm going to go, oh, can I say this? Can I not say this? Can I say this? Can yeah. I not say this? <laughs> um, but I've had the same thing happen to me. And telling my story, finding a way to tell my story um, amid the gag laws has been, it actually looked impossible because the police didn't want to hear my story because oh. they would then interview him and he would say, no, nah, no, nah, it was a two-way conversation. Yeah. Sorry. Three other neighbors called the police because of what they witnessed and their fears for what was happening. And it just goes away because he says, Yeah. Because he mean it. And I think that that really comes back to that systemic, the systemic teaching that men's word and Mm. men are more valuable than women. Yeah. There is this that that their word is more powerful than women. Mm. Uh, and, And and it does it does really ring so true for me with that because and and yeah it's it's from from a very from a micro level you know you being a woman haven't experienced that and mm. fuck I'm sorry and I know that I'm not the one but you know I I grieve with you I grieve with you for that because it's it's disgusting in and of itself the act and then the fact that nothing gets done about it mm. even more so there's no justice Part of, part of that, and I feel I feel like there there is that that's part of that creation that men own women, that men mm. are more important than women in society. Mm. That you know we are we are the breeders, and I feel like we talk about going deep for a moment. This kind of even even goes into more of my my spiritual kind of side of things. Mm. Many 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 moons ago, lots mm. of generations ago, they burned us yes. because we were good with herbs outside of the kitchen. They, they burned us because we connected with nature. They burned us because, yeah. because we could connect with the moon and create life, you know. Yeah. They, and, and we can't, I don't think we can dismiss the history totally. of women in our life. The fact that they, they, there was, we, the reason we call it a witch hunt now is because of the witch hunts. Yes. They, yeah. they, weren't, they weren't made up. This isn't, this, yeah. isn't, this isn't a fictional fairy tale no. of, Hunt down the witches. This actually happened. Women mm. were burnt at the stake because mm. they were connected to nature. Yeah, because they threatened the the innate power. I feel like mm. somewhere along the lines in history, there was a recognition of women's power, yeah. and the only way that they could squash women's power was by over, like using strength. 
you know, the broad, like the, the, the brawn of it, you know, men are physically generally stronger than women. They yeah. can hold us down. Yeah. And there's a threatening of that until the until until the, the the woman decides to reclaim that power and the man decides to reclaim his own, not by stealing it from others. Yeah. I don't think we're going to get a change systemically when we still have leaders, when we still have people at the top of our food chain supporting gag policies because they haven't mm. done their work. They mm. climb on top of women. They climb on top of other men. I'm sure you've experienced that in the corporate world. That the, yeah. That the the way that other pe- the way that people get power in our world is egoic, and they get power by stealing it from other people. Mm. But if people could just realize that they are in and of themselves incredibly powerful, if they can mm. claim their own power, men or women, gender aside, if you can claim your internal sovereignty, you don't ever have to steal from someone else because yeah. there is so much internal that you have. We just yeah. need to have this kind of stuff. You can't. Mm. To me, I've always said this, and I said it's about a lot of things that's going on in the world right now. Change will not happen within the system. Unfortunately, for me, I believe mm. that consciousness needs to change. We need mm. to change the way we think, the way we see each other, the way we see our relationship to the world and the universe. Mm. If mm. we can reclaim our divinity on the inside, then we don't need to shit all over other people. Totally, totally. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I agree 100%. I think that, um, you know, Luna, my work is gender gap gone, but I don't just work with women. I work with a lot of men. Mm. And when I'm working with corporate, so a lot of the, um, whether it be the coaching programs or the corporate programs that I do, mm. there's men and women in those programs. Yeah. Um, and I think that, um, and the courses as well tend to be a little bit more women than men. But, you know, I think that in my experience, a lot of the, injustices a lot of the whether it be workplace bullying whether it be the um, inequity at home Mm. all of those places where there's inequity Mm. a lot of it comes down to fear yeah and so the more courage that we can give people the more that we can enable people to feel secure in their ability you know building that growth mindset the more that we can give people the absolute deep belief that they're not stuck that they're not trapped they actually can get whatever they want (laughs) totally totally and that if you are broken fill those gaps with gold baby it's stunning and it's part of your strength you know the more that we can allow all people to feel more courageous because they've got evidence that they can get out of whatever they're stuck in yeah the less they judge other people Mm -hmm. and the more inclusive we are the yep. more engaging we are, yeah. the more we can all rise instead yes. of, you know, the big stick. It just doesn't help. There are times that we need it, but for the most part, it's not going to change our culture. The big stick won't change our culture. It just makes people angry. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm. And, it, and it, it makes people angry, which is based in fear once again. Totally. It, yeah. It, it is this, I know that it's just, it, it can be a simplification, mm. One of the one of the the models that I live by is mm. I'm either in fear or I'm in love. Yes. And and how do I choose to live through a whole bunch of stuff? How am I yeah. living through this time in our in our generations? How am I deciding? Irrelevant to what's going on outside of me, I think that if we continue to to look outside yeah. for our for our validation, for our happiness, for yeah. our our acknowledgement for our validation if we whenever we're looking outside we're looking in the wrong direction totally because courage I, I love and I'm sure I'm sure I, I can't be 100% sure but I'm sure that you uh, you're familiar with the work of Brene Brown yes um and she talks about oh is it in her book it just occurred to me that it, it might not be it, it's actually in another author that I'm thinking about Matt Kahn he talks okay. about he talks about the he talks about the, the foundation of the word courage. It comes yes. from the Latin word cor, C-O-U-R. Yes. And the original meaning of the word courage was to show one's heart. Yes. And in Brene Brown's work, she talks about, she talks about soft front, hard back, open heart. Mm. Because what the world that we currently live in is that we have a closed front. We are hard on the front and but really soft in the back. We have a very weak spine. We're not particularly courageous. Mm. To be all of you, to show who you are, it's an incredible amount of strength and courage. Mm. Vulnerability to me is courage. 
That's yeah. the epitome of it. Show yourself. Mm. Be your true self. Speak your truth. Be you and have that level of courage because most people are living in fear because they think that courage comes, that they'll get courageous and then they'll yeah. be able to overcome fear. Yeah. yeah. But the reality is, is that courage only shows up when you're afraid. Yeah. You have to be afraid. You have to be walking into fear in order for courage to show up. That's, that's how that works, which to me is a choice of faith, of love over the fear. I look at fear. I love Elizabeth Gilbert's. Yeah. Elizabeth Gilbert's take on this with fear. She says, fear's my companion. It's coming with me. It's on a road trip. Yes. Come on. We're, like we're going. We're going to go do the thing. Fear wants to hold me back because it wants to mm. be in the driver's seat. Mm. I'm not going to chuck it in the boot. It needs to sit in the back seat comfortably. It never gets to change yes. into music. It never yeah. gets to drive. It never gets to navigate. It just comes with me on everything that I do. And that that is courage. It really is. It really is. Yeah. I think when we're talking about sort of change at a bigger level, so there's change within ourselves and there's also change for the greater good, mm. there was this um, um, when you said, you said, you know, you, you're either living in fear or living with fear or with love. And oh, yeah. Then you mentioned Brene Brown and I just lit up because I was listening to a podcast that she did a couple of weeks ago and um, she was interviewing Tarana Burke, who was um, the Me Too movement founder. Oh, cool, and yeah. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal interview. She's just written this enormous big book and it's um, her story and it's her personal story and the Me Too movement story. Mm. Anyway, so Tarana Burke talks about living with both. Mm that sometimes you actually need to live with both. And I think that yeah. judgment often makes nice. us go from one or the other. Mm -hmm. And she talks about, you know, that sometimes, um, you know, for example, when there's a situation where um, a good person does a really bad thing, yeah. that's really hard to live with. But unless yes. we can acknowledge that you sometimes you do have to live with both. Yeah. That's yes. why it's so hard to say that the perpetrator is a perpetrator because we love this person. Yes. To be able oh. to just pigeonhole them as a bad guy is yep. really hard. Yes. Sometimes we do need to live with the fact that you can love a person at the same time as really not being okay with what they've done. You love can that. love a person but also say, I need to disconnect from you because Boundaries. of what you've done because... Yep what you've done is not okay for my community or my society or for my mm -hmm. family. Yep. Um, but you can live with both. You can still mm. honour the connection that you have with that person and at the same time say the boundaries for our future require me to put this line here and, and stop contact or whatever the boundaries that you need yes. to say or just to speak up and say I love you but what you just said is yep. not tolerable. Yes. I it was dropping in for me as you were talking and I friggin' love it because I did say around, you know, you either live in fear or you live in love. The yeah. only way that you get to choose love is by yes. recognising fear. You totally. have, to have to live with both. Uh, that, yeah. That's the reality. It is human existence is, is, yeah. a, is a paradox. It's a, it's yes. a dichotomy. It is binary. Yeah. We have the sun and the moon. We have the night and the day. We have the inside and the outside. Yeah. The, we have the in-breath. Yeah. We have the ex ex external breath, right? But yeah. what we have in between the in-breath and the out-breath is a gap. Yeah, that pause. There's a pause mm. on either end of that. Mm. And it's we need both of those things. We mm. need, uh, in, in Neil Donald Walsh's book, Conversations with God, there's an incredible line where he says, we must experience everything that we are not in order to choose who we are. Mm. And I remember reading that 1,400 times. It's in yeah. my book, actually, because I'm like, in order, we have to experience everything that we are not in I order to that. choose who we are. Yeah. Because we need to sit there and acknowledge if we, that to me what it means, if we don't acknowledge fear, if mm. we don't acknowledge that two seemingly opposing truths can exist at the same time, mm. then we are completely disempowered. Mm. We're not in the reality, if we mm. are still under the illusion that said person who did bad thing to you, mm. no, but it couldn't possibly be true because he's amazing. Yes. If we live in that bubble, yeah. then then we're not living in truth. If he's mm. only evil, mm. 
then then we're not able to see the whole spectrum. We need to be able to zoom out and go, those two things can exist. This person yes. can be somebody that I love yes. who did something evil. Yes, yes. And, and then from that position I can go, cool, I love this person, but I'm setting the boundary, as you totally. said. That it's not okay what they've done. Yeah. I'm not making it okay, but I'm also not, I was victimised, but I'm not the victim. Totally. Two completely different things. So we need to come to that place where we're able to have, and I think that it comes back to courage again, the courage to look at both, like look at the dichotomy and live. Mm. When we talk about, you were saying before about um, equality wasn't the word you used. What was it? E- e- economy? E- e- you said something before, sure. equanimity? Not sure. I don't know. It was one of those EQ words. <laughs> it was beautiful. That there, in order for us to live happy, it, it is about noticing the the complete extremes of the world and what's happening. Yeah. And coming to the middle, which to me is bridging the gap. Yeah. You've got maybe this happening on this side, this happening on this mm-hmm. side, and you coming together to be able to look at the whole. You come back, and I even see this on multiple levels. You come back into your own internal center. Which means that you can you can take the whole. Yeah. If you're externalized, you can only look at one point at the same time. For sure. For sure. Oh. Do you know I think a really big part of this work for me is helping people to verbalize that because we do have this conditioning, right? We do have this conditioning. Mm. And you know, um, there is so much beauty in in all that we're just talking about. There's so much beauty in being able to work in this context. Um this is it shows up in the workplace where you've got the awful boss you learn so much from yeah you know like there's yeah there is light and shade and everything but for individuals you know like how do we embrace that inner self of um how do we embrace that inner voice yeah do you know you know that passive aggressive sort of spectrum no fine. i often think I'm fine <laughs> how do we totally talk about? totally I'm fine Absolutely. <laughs> so I talk with people about this passive aggressive spectrum and the fact that like at one end, at the passive end, really you're biting your tongue and um, keeping it in, being the good girl, going with conditioning, not wanting to make waves, trying to make a good impression. But that stuff is still going on inside. It's yes. bottling up and bottling up and bottling up. And you don't want to be aggressive, but the trick is, the trouble is like, Luna, if I asked you to write, are you right-handed? Yes. Okay, so if I asked you to pick up your pen and, mm-hmm. and then I asked you what it looks like, what would you say? What does your signature look like? Can you repeat that? You glitched ever so slightly. Sure. So pick up my pen, say it again for yeah. me. Sign your name for me. So sign your name somewhere for me. Yeah. Okay, what does it look like? Kind of looks like a scribble. Okay, great. And how comfortable was it? Very. Okay, I'm going to ask you to swap hands. Okay. And then sign your name. <laughs> what did that look like? I mean, it's a mess. The, yeah. I think the, the, the first bit was okay, yep. but, the, but the rest of it, it they, they're practically unrecognisable. <laughs> okay, awesome. And how, how comfortable was it? It was uncomfortable. I feel like yeah. I, I, I didn't feel like I have competency in it. It was Yeah, uh, great. It was awkward, I would say. Okay. Okay. So let me ask you this. If somebody else saw the second signature, would they judge you for that or would they just be going, oh, that's Luna's signature? Yeah. No, of course, because people would people would just perceive it as is. They would just go, yeah. well, that's how it is. That's just, yes. that's her signature. They wouldn't, yeah. unless you yeah. saw the comparison, you wouldn't yeah. know. Yes. Totally. Okay. So here's the thing. When you are practicing using your voice, when you are practicing speaking up for yourself or for others, it's really similar. When you first start to do that, when you first start to speak up, it's going to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. But nobody else knows. Yes. Nobody else knows. There's this thing called a spotlight bias where we think that everybody else there's, you know, like unconscious bias has so many little smaller competencies in it, so, so many mm. smaller um, components to it. And one of them is this egocentric bias. And egocentric bias is the one that's responsible for us thinking that all of our perceptions of our imperfections yep. are true. Are true. <laughs> and that you see them all. 
that everybody, everybody else, else sees them all. Oh my God, you, they, they must notice this little this little pimple coming through on my cheek. Yeah, they must notice yes, that, exactly. that, my, that my top, whatever. Yeah, Absolutely. like Absolutely. Yeah, I notice, notice it all, that, but do you? Exactly. They must notice that when I'm doing a presentation, my paper is shaking like a leaf. Yeah. Nobody sees it. Only you. Only you see it. But the thing is that that initial phase of like if you had to swap hands for some reason, if you had mm. suddenly, um, I don't know, if you decided that you were going, I don't know. Well, you break your hand, right? right? If I break my right, right hand, yeah, I right. can't write. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So initially your second signature, your left-hand signature is going to look childlike. Mm-hmm. But you practice it a few times, you practice it a few more times. Mm-hmm. It's actually at the beginning, it's going to get really close to your ideal signature. Oh, wow. And so the same thing when you speak up, you know, like initially it's going to feel childlike to you, but nobody else is noticing, just you. Yeah. So you need to practice it and practice it and practice it. This is how you build that muscle, build that courage. And if you don't practice it, if you practice it, you're going to keep it in, keep it in, keep it in, and then you're going to blurt and scream the house down and you are going to do damage to your reputation. Yeah. So it's far better to let that baby out slowly and constantly mm-hmm. and practice it and get stronger and stronger. Yes. That's how you build it. Yes, and that and there's two there's two points there that I'd, I'd love to speak into because mm. it really is practice makes progress. Totally. But ah, this whole idea yes. in, in in my head, totally. I I always thought the practice made perfect, and mm. but but then you're aiming towards some kind of end. To me, practice makes progress. I I literally. I literally spent my whole life growing up thinking that people who were successful were either lucky, literally, like they were just born that way, talented. Um, well, I thought that I thought that was true, that they were just talented and I couldn't be them. Yes. That's, that's what I just thought. And it was for somebody else. Yeah, it just happens to someone else. Yeah. It, it was literally wasn't until I was in my coach training and I learned, I learned one of the foundations of coaching success was there is no failure, only feedback. Mm-hmm. and very basic entry-level coaching stuff. But I was like, hang on, sorry, what? Yeah. And, <laughs> and it seems bizarre to me that I just didn't know this. In my, in my, in my childhood, how I was raised was that yeah. if you weren't good at something, you weren't good at something. Don't yeah. give up your day job was told to me when I would play <laughs> instruments or sing or, or try something new. I would get called by my elder brothers, you know, you, you're, you're a, very awful word, but you're a spastic, you know, you're just, un- your uncle, give up. And that's, I thought, okay, well, I'm just not very good at things. Yeah. But it wasn't that's until, identity. it was my identity. It wasn't yeah. until somebody came and shook that foundation belief and said to me, no, no, like when you fail, like the only, he actually, the, 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 the trainer also said something to me, not to me personally, obviously to the group, but said, when he said there's no failure, only feedback, he goes, the only way to succeed is to fail. Yeah, totally. and I went stop it. I just powerful, isn't it? It changed my entire life. And then, yeah. and then when I I decided to learn how to play roller derby, are you familiar with that? Yes, I yeah. love that. I love it so much. So, and I I didn't know how to roller skate. I had never roller skated in my life. Really, twenty twenty eight or something. <gasps> so probably 10 years I love it even now. more now. Wow, and that's awesome. Never knew how to roller skate, and my partner at the time was a very proficient skater, ice hockey yeah. player who translated his skills onto quads, quad roller skates for me so that he could show me. And, my God, I fell over. Like, it took me 15 minutes to stand up the very first time. Yeah. And three years, multiple knee surgeries in order to get to the point where I could play a game. Wow. Properly, a full contact, be drafted into a team. It took me three years. And every single time I fell over, I talk about this in my book, he, he would say to me something that his coach told him. And he would say to him, you know, son, if you're not falling over, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah. And all these things around practice making progress. Yeah. And that everybody else, the second point that I wanted to hear about your story is that everybody else is more concerned about their own shit. Totally. Honestly, like they're terrified themselves to get up yes. and do that presentation. Yeah. They're they juggling their own insecurities, up. right? They're in their own head, in their own spotlight yeah, bias. Totally, <laughs> exactly. Own, and even if they are judging you on the inside, you're never going to know. And it's pretty likely that you're the worst critic anyway. Absolutely. So yeah. I'm with you. Speak up. Pra- practice the skill. Mm. Because as you practice that, I love what you just did with the handwriting there. 
you just make progress. Mm. And and it isn't about getting to a certain spot. I, I often share this with you don't I don't get to a place, you don't get to a place where all of a sudden you're like, I made it. I'm 100% <laughs> confident. Nothing ever gets me. I never have self-doubt. I am now the, you know, all <laughs> human. Can I just say, I hope that you have that moment for a moment on Friday, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You deserve that moment all the time. But my Thank God, you. I hope you claim that moment on Friday. Thank you. I, I, I will. I take that. I, it's, it's part of part of the journey as well. I think you, you know this. You're a two-time best-selling author. You know the moment where you where where you start. You know, I, I was raised to believe that I shouldn't shine. Mm. And that's why this work is so important for me, Kath, because mm. it's very personal for me. Yeah. The, the idea that I would then, we talked about this the other day when you and I were talking, like to be at my biggest after hating my body for my whole life, being mm. afraid to wear certain clothes, being afraid to be in my body, to now be in a bikini on the sitting down, <laughs> no less, not liking the most flattering how yeah. long can I make my body it's position. It's style. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm on the ground. Like I'm it's, it's just all out. Thank it's you. A yeah. Gorgeous to, photo. To then be to be on the cover of a book, my yeah. book, no doubt, um, no less, is is a profound experience because yeah. it is continuing to talk about that onion going back. Yeah. The layers to me, it, it's it's Similar, I know the foundational beliefs between the ages of zero and seven, our map is created of our reality yeah. cognitively in our brain. Yeah. And we are learning everything. In those seven years, I learned that women were not enough. Mm. They, they, were also, they, were, they were at the same time too much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> women totally. were equally too much, like, shh, yes. Yes. be quiet, little girl. I, I learned that, that my bigness would make other people uncomfortable. Yeah. I learned that men were more important. I learned that a whole bunch of children shouldn't to the point, mm. Kath, where literally as a as a 16-year-old, I was so sick. I got gallstones when I was 16. Mm. That isn't in the book, so bonus content for you. <laughs> <laughs> I was 16 and I got gallstones after losing weight really dramatically because I was so terrified of being fat because I just thought that is, that's what I just had to do. And, and I was so sick that I went, I went into hospital and this is a, literally the first time in my life that I recognised that something was a bit erroneous here mm. because I'm in hospital and, the, and before I'm going in for surgery, the doctors say to me, you're going to have to have a bowel movement before you go into your general anaesthetic. And I laughed. I said, don't be silly. I went yesterday. And he looked at me and was like, so... When do you think you're going to go next? And I was like, four days time. And he goes, you only you only poo twice a week. And I was like, if you know, I try not to. And he's like, what are you talking about? Now I grew up with four older brothers. Yeah. Who thought who would tell me, jokingly or not, they yeah. told me that girls don't poo or fart. Wow. I was a child. We mm. take things at face value. No one yeah. told me any otherwise. So I actually grew up with an immense amount of shame, shame around a bodily function because I was a girl. Mm. Girls don't poo or fart. So every time I, I, I tried to only poo when I was out of the house so nobody would know that I was doing it. Wow. So I would hold on for days and have literally done huge damage to my digestive system. Yes. Yeah. Huge digression here. What I'm saying is that there's all these foundational beliefs that that still play out, that need yeah. to be unraveled, that yeah. that I'm I'm on alert, not constant alert, because now I've reached a certain level where I just think I'm rad and of course I'm gonna shine. I'm so glad. Yes. But there are <laughs> thank you. There are certain moments where and I think what you're saying here about the, the practice, when you move into something new, yeah. when you're doing something for the first time or the first few times. Mm. It's very likely that some of that doubt mm. may come up. Mm. And it's having the tools like you probably teach in Asked to be mm. able to overcome that doubt. Mm. You know, that, that's when it's really critical. For sure. Tell me, we've for been sure. talking for ages, so, so I want to I honour your time and everyone's time here. Can you tell me, courage is something that we've talked about a lot here. Mm. Can you tell me, for the sake of the audience, how, how do we cultivate that? How do we... Mm. How do we 
be more courageous in our life to 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 speak out and yeah you know, be us Honestly, my favourite strategy um, is so much my favourite strategy that I wrote the second book about it. And the second book is a journal and it's called um, The Did Great Habit. Um, I can tell you briefly how this story, how this book came about. So we were living through um, quite horrendous trauma. They said it was the worst case of psychological abuse that they'd seen, the specialists were telling me. Um, And so the kids and I um, were in this place where there was just... Everything was tense. There was constant bickering. They were at each other the whole time. You know, it was just, it was miserable. Inside our four walls, it was just miserable. Despite the, you know, the love, it was miserable because it was so tense. And so my mum has, my mum's a teacher and she would just forever be saying to me, catch them being good, Kathy, catch them being good. And I'm like, are you serious? There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing going on here but bickering. How can I catch anything good in this situation? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. this one day I was at breaking point and I sat down with this tiny, in fact, my desk now was my old dining table. I, could, I don't know if you can yeah. see where my hands are. That's the end of the table, right? Yeah, right, yeah. So um, tiny table, it was our little um, dining table. This one um, afternoon so the kids have gone off to school and daycare this day and I have this little vase sitting on my desk on the table and I grabbed a stack of brightly colored post-it notes and I just started grabbing them and just writing down one post-it note for each kid and like the things that they had done that day that were great right and I was seriously scratching at straws you know like I was I really had to dig deep, like digging at nothing to, yes. to find anything to fill like a post well note. Today. They yes, blinked, they totally. blinked effectively. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, yeah. I love that you picked your towel up. I love that you, like, really minor stuff. Yep. I love that you showed your sister how to, or helped her with the shoelaces. Like, I was on really sort of micro detail to find something mm-hmm. they did right. Anyway. I folded them all and I put them in the middle of these little short little vase in the middle of our dining table. And that night, I remember what we had for dinner. It was pies and veg. So we're sitting around the dining table, pies and veg. And the kids were like, what's that? What's that? What's that? I'm like, I'll tell you later. I'll tell you later. We get to the end of the meal and we sort of push the plates aside. Didn't even clear them. Everyone was sitting there transfixed about these brightly colored posters. Yes. Yeah. And so I started to open them up and read them out our world changed literally oh. within hours. Yes. Everything changed. Yes. Everything changed. Like by the next morning, the kids were totally on alert for um, looking around, see what they could do that was great for somebody, you know, like yes. helping each other out, looking for kind things to say to each other. Within 72 hours, they were writing the post-it notes themselves and putting oh, them cat. into the jar and then writing things about me, like what kids say that their mum is great. It just doesn't oh happen. Gosh. But that's what happened. And then not only did it work so beautifully for transforming our little world, mm-hmm. and as you said, like everything is, none of this stuff, none of these strategies are permanent. Mm-hmm. So, you know. At all, but like in the same way you're building a house, you you need totally. the hammer, you need the saw, you yeah. need the nail, you need like you need a you need a whole yes. plethora of tools. For sure. Yeah. But this is the one that I come back to time and again. So when we slip, it's like righto. If the kids are nasty to each other in the car, seriously, I'm like, right, none of this. Nobody's saying another word until you come up with three things that your sister's done that you appreciate. Wow. And it changes the energy instantly. Yes. And it was so transformational. Honestly, I use it with my clients and client after client after wow. client found it so powerful. I had clients who were team leaders who had totally dysfunctional teams yep. and they would apply this same strategy in their teams and I mean like not just giving their own feedback because sometimes that can be patronizing you know like if yep. you're celebrating someone who doesn't want to hear it totally patronizing yep. but if I have a team who has a reputation in the business or I have a team member who thinks that they're perceived badly by the business mm-hmm. if I go and get feedback from the business about the things that they're appreciated for yeah that sits beautifully. Yes. So this idea of this power of celebration, of self-appreciation, and that's what the second book is. The the Did Great Habit is a journal. So whether you choose to use a journal, my goodness, great. But if you just, seriously, if you just stick with post-it notes or a paper book or, you know, the notes page in your phone, Uh the most important part of this is that you build a habit. Yes. That you build it as a habit. Yeah. I love it. I think that there's that that strategy is phenomenal. I often find if I've, if I've got clients and they come, they come to me and they're, and they're in a, in a state and I can tell they're in a state of, yes. of 
victimhood or, you know, they're in a particularly particular, particularly uh, heightened state of, of yeah. unhappiness. Yeah. I take, we take some breaths together always in the beginning of the session so we land together. And then okay. I said, cool, I'm setting a timer for the next 90 seconds. And here's, we're going to play the gratitude game. Great. What you're going to do is you're going to label everything that you can possibly be thankful for out loud as quickly as you can for the full 90 seconds. So literally, yep. and, I, and I show them how to do it. This is how I would do it. I'm like, I'm so grateful for the lights coming through. I'm actually really grateful it's not too sunny here today because it's better for the light in the room. I'm really grateful yeah. that I have a laptop. I'm super yeah. grateful for electricity and I have clean drinking water. I'm really grateful for, for the internet and I'm grateful for Kath and I'm grateful for my hairbrush. I'm grateful yeah. that I have water to, to a shampoo to wash my hair. Yeah. I just get them to go as, as you say, as you sat there in that moment mm. at, your, at your desk kitchen table and look at the smallest thing. Can you be grateful for your fingernails? Because imagine mm. life without your fingernails. Mm. That would be weird. Mm. Your skin, your the way your, your body grows hair, you mm. know, there, there's so much. If we can stop and actually appreciate the things that are around us, our life 100% changes. For sure, it does. Thank you for, thank you for sharing that. That was magic. No worries. Luna, can I challenge you with the gratitude? I would love you to, please. So I know that um, I have some very dear friends like you who are huge proponents of gratitude, and I certainly was there as well. Yep. But I found that gratitude worked beautifully mm -hmm. when I had a white picket fence life. Yeah, okay, cool, yep. When I was rocked to my core and literally had to build from the ground up, yep. um, gratitude was actually one of the worst things for me. Yeah, so when I was gosh. at my worst point and I really genuinely believe that the world would be better off without me, that my kids would be yeah. better off without me, mm -hmm. gratitude was the thing that meant that I was doing them a disservice by being here. Yeah, right. What I actually had to rebuild mm -hmm. was self-appreciation, not just. Appreciate. And because the good girl, like the good girl is conditioned to be appreciative of everything. Yes. So the good girl, the, the good girl nature that I had, yeah. I was naturally grateful. Yeah. But what I didn't have, I needed to switch that up and I needed yep. to make sure that I was appreciating myself mm -hmm. and my abilities, what I'd done before, what I was able to do Love in it. order to have the strength to move forward. Thank you for that. What, what's, the di what, what's the difference for you if we can articulate it between gratitude and appreciation? What Pride. How, pardon? Pride. Pride. Yeah, yeah. Also actually being proud of yourself. Is totally. That what you Totally. Let me give an example. So in a, in a workplace context, right? Yep. So um, the girl who has always been incredibly grateful, mm -hmm. when she's faced with that next promotion, what's going through her head is, um, you know, congratulations, Luna, you've done so well on this. I'm so pleased. I'm so proud of you for getting this book into the world. This is amazing. And Luna says, oh, my God, it was nothing. Like, you know, it, I wouldn't have been able to do it without Dave, with Davina, without this team, without this cohort, without these support network behind me i'm here on the back of other people i don't know if i can swear here but bullshit you, Luna, you, you created place. that luck you created that place where yeah. this is your brilliance but if you think that you are here because of somebody else's support and that's yeah. the only reason you're here the next time someone says to you luna i think that it's time for you to write a book about such and such you're going to go i don't think have another one in me that one was so big and so fantastic. I didn't think I could do it again. Because you don't think that you can count on the support of all those other people. You didn't think it yeah, came right. from you. You think it came from your education or from yep. your background. These mm. other people, these external things, not from you. Oh. I'm. <laughs> you can tell that I'm quiet, right? Because, <laughs> because you know, Staring down the barrel of this week, mm. and, it, and it has been. I share this. I'm, I'm share, I share myself very openly with my listeners mm. here, so I hope they appreciate that that this is a moment for me because because it has been a sense. I, I reached out to a dear friend early this week, and 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 I was in tears. I'm like, I don't know how to celebrate myself. Yes, I'm. I'm this thing's about to happen. I did this big thing. Yes, and I'm not sure <laughs> how to receive 
I, I'm, I'm not oh, sure how to celebrate it, right? Yes, because yes. even even you know, Kath, there was this thing of me going six months ago, literally today, I delivered a baby. Yes, and in two days' time. I'm delivering a book yes. and both of those things, the word that you just said there was like, I mean, they're just things that I did. Yeah. That, I'm, that <laughs> physical, for those of you on the podcast, I'm like shrugging my shoulders and my hands up in the air. Yeah. They haven't felt particularly like a big deal because they're just things that I did. Yeah. But I recognise that I need to think that they're a bit, they are I big do. deals. If I was I looking do. at someone else. Yes. Having mm-hmm. had a baby for another human. Yes. And then wrote a damn book. Yes. And did those both those things delivered in the same year. Yes. I need to friggin' stop and celebrate that. You really do. You do. <laughs> and own you it like it's mine. You. Totally. Yeah. You need to do that for you, for your next steps, for the six months down the track that you've forgotten that you did these amazing things. Mm. You need them recorded somewhere. You need them in your face. You need that feeling captured so that the next time you are worrying or wondering, can I do this? You can come back to the feeling that you had in this moment where you did justice to yourself and you honoured yourself and your journey mm. completely. You need it for you but you also need it for anyone who follows you. Correct. Because so, you give them permission to do the same. Naturally, yes, yes, and thank you. And th- I'm, I'm so grateful for this conversation. I'm appreciative. How do I appreciate it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like that distinction there you said, you said yeah. we gold, but the difference between the gratitude and the appreciation is pride. I'm appreciative of me. Yes, yes, not, great. Not my external circumstances because you're right. When yeah. I said the gratitude dream, I was grateful for all the things outside of me. Yes. Not yes. like, hey, I'm grateful for your courage. I'm grateful yes. for the decisions that you've made. I'm so appreciate how fucking committed you were to just totally. write this book and totally. you wrote 112,000 words up. and you again made it happen and, and you again did the thing and, and you keep showing. Yes. yes. So thank you. I think that that is absolute pure gold, both mm. for myself, um, which I wholly, wholeheartedly appreciate. Thank you. And, of course, for everyone listening because this is a, this is an evolution yeah journey can sometimes feel a bit wanky it is a journey yeah. I think it's an evolution it's yeah. each step that we come into ourselves each new moment I as you said with the onion I spent a lifetime not appreciating myself because yes. because I was literally told not to yes totally <laughs> totally and, figuratively we are. and, brush it and off. conditionally and brushed yeah. off yeah, You know, I, I, I share the story with my friends that for whatever reason, and I hold no harm against them anymore, but my parents didn't come to my year 12 graduation. Mm. It wasn't important. Mm. And so I didn't make it important. I didn't go. Yeah. It was just no big deal. I just finished yeah. school. Whatever. Move yeah. on. Yeah. So it, there's always been this attitude of whatever, just move on, do these big things, but I've never felt particularly accomplished. Yeah. But I think that it's actually in my evolution something that I must. <laughs> Lines in the sand is right here. I see it. I feel it. This is so exciting. Thank you. So exciting. Let's normalise saying um, instead of saying, oh, it was nothing, let's yep. normalise saying thank you and thank you for celebrating with me. Yes, because, because I've worked my ass off. Yeah. Because, uh, because I did that. I, yes. I, I did it. I made that happen. And yes. yeah, of course, there's supporters and people and stuff. But yes. the reality is, I'm the only one that sat down and wrote those words. Yes. Yes. I'm the only one that lived that 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 life to be able to create that. That's yeah. the reality. I'm Absolutely. the one that sat there and did it and took the courageous steps yeah. to maybe engage a team like Dave and Davina. For sure. You know? Absolutely. Thank you, my friend. Congrats to you. Thank you. I did a big thing. <laughs> Such a big thing. Two massive, massive, massive things. Yes. Yeah, and all the other little things that celebrate, all the other things along the way that go into celebrating those big things. Yeah. Yeah. Huge I love, things. I also love that you, and this is true, I, I want to point this out for everybody. You wouldn't have noticed that Kath did this. As a coach myself, I 100% noticed that Kath did this. Kath asked for permission. You asked for permission before you challenged me. You said to me, can I challenge you on that mm. about the gratitude? And and I want everybody listening at home that that's 
that piece in communication, I know it's got nothing to do with particularly what we're talking about mm. here, but ask consent mm. before you give someone feedback. Mm. Because I might not have been in a space where I was wanting to hear that, but but if you watch the video back as well, I lent in. When Kath said that, when you said that, Kath, I lent in. I was like, yep, what do you got? Yeah. Like, I was, I was not only like, okay, like this yeah. sure is not consent. This enthusiastic consent, I was like, Give it to me. What like what mm. have I what have I got? So I want to highlight that as well. So thank you for asking consent before you gave me the challenge. My pleasure. I really appreciate it. Tell me, Kath, before we finish off for today, can we look at your books? Can we see them? Do you have them there? I know that you've got one coming out very soon. Is that right? I do. I'm hot on your tails. A couple of days from now. Yeah, a couple of days That's from now. That's beautiful. So show about... us the first two. So this is the Dig Great Habit. Ah, oh, I love it. And don't be asked. Don't be asked. Yeah. Um, and, and, and number one bestsellers for both of them. This is incredible. Yeah, they are. So on the, on the, is it the 6th of October? It is, yes, the 6th of October. 6th of October, October that, that yeah. your new book. What's your new book called? It's called Lost for Words. And, and what, is, what is it about? Yeah, so this is about um, one of the things that I do in my work is helping people to craft their stories. So like in a, in a workplace, you know, how do you make sure that your words come across in a way that people hear you? Nice. Yeah. But the challenge is you can't edit a blank page. And you know how I told you earlier about, you know, people sit down and men and women will talk, think about their abilities differently. Like men will have, be able to tell you all their strengths. Women can't so much. Yep. My main space is working with women or people who um, would like more courage. Mm -hmm. And so for those people who can't fill a page with the things that they've done well, this book is about how do you how do you capture your stories? Yeah. How do you store the stories? And how do you um, make sure that you can pull them out in a way that's resonant for the people you want to speak to so that I can tell you about how brilliant I am in this particular skill so yeah. that you will think of me next time you need someone for that particular project that allows me to work in my zone of brilliance. I love that. And then, and then I feel like there's a birdie whisper knowing that what leads in from that is an, an incredible course for people to be able to attend. Is there, is there something that you have created alongside of this amazing yeah, work? There is. So um, it's actually a, so this, this book really sort of sits in, in communication. That's module four of this six week program that we're just about to launch in two weeks time. And it's, oh. it's called the impactful career, my impactful career. Yes. And I'm so excited. You know, the stats at the moment, every couple of days is more stats about this and there's, um, but PwC research is showing that 65% of people at the moment are mm. looking for work. Wow. So the job boards, 65% of people are looking at work. Because they're out of work or because they're in work and want something different? I think, you know how, um, you know how, like when you go through a life change, whether it's a, um, you know, maybe you move house or, you know, you find a new partner, lose a partner, lose a loved one, mm -hmm. you kind of go through this transition space where you're like, I've changed the work that I'm doing doesn't fit me anymore. I need yeah. to change a little bit. I've grown it, as you were saying totally, before. Totally, yeah, totally. Yeah. We've gone through that globally. In the last yes. two years, we've all gone through that enormous self-reflection. So I think that across the board, people have got this almighty kind of, I call it the um, career meh, you know, like yeah. it's, uh, it's yeah. okay. It doesn't quite fit, but it's not, you know, it's like a stone in my shoe. It's not like, it's it's a bit annoying. It's not quite like, oh my God, get that off. Yeah. But it's just kind of, eh. yeah. And I think that's where we are. Well, 65% of people are, the stats are saying. So, yeah. Wow. Wow. So then people, if they're feeling that kind of career there, if they're going, look, I, I feel like I could be, I could be doing more. I yes. feel like I, I could be pushing myself um, yeah. beyond that yeah. than what I'm doing. I've outgrown where I am, but I don't know where I can grow into and I don't necessarily totally. have the courage or the confidence to be able to totally. take a step forward then you are the gal and the book and the course is is the place for them to come to. Yeah, it is. I actually have a couple of people in mind that I've been working with lately that I feel like will get a hell of a lot of value out of that. Awesome. So that sounds I, great. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm thinking that I'm gonna I'm gonna let them know about you. That sounds awesome. Thank you, Luna. There's a um, there's a, a cool freebie if it's useful. So the website's gapgone. If you go to gapgone.com.au yep. forward slash energy. Yep. Um Awesome. That's a really helpful resource for helping people to get past that kind of meh, whether it's about their career or whatever mm -hmm. other space. Yeah. Um, it's, I guess it's kind of an energy pep talk, really. 
um, which yeah. I kind of feel like that's what today's conversation has been too. It has, hasn't it, Emma? It's been great. <laughs> It has, Emma. So everything's going to be in the show notes. So okay, sure. if you want the free research, gapgorn.com.au forward slash energy, it'll all be in the show notes. So please go and, and go check out Kat's work. Her book is coming out on the 6th of October, which is just in, what are we looking at? A week, a yes, week or so. A week today, yeah. A week today, which is super, super exciting. So that that, that is the 6th of October. It's coming up. Please go get behind, behind Kat. I mean, you can see that clearly she is a powerhouse, knows exactly what she's doing in this space. And and if you if you resonate with her vibe, then I cannot recommend her highly enough. Thank you so much, Kath. Is there any last thing that you want my listeners, people out there to, to watch in this clip to be able to know any, any last bit of wisdom that you would like to impart? Sterling, I think it's just keep building that habit of noticing your brilliance. Oh, oh I'm doing that. I'm going to do that. I'm doing that. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kath. So much appreciated. Pleasure. Talk soon, lovely. Bye. Bye. Wow. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that was a heaven of a conversation. Goodness me, Catherine Nolan. I man, could you see that her and I could just bounce, just bounce ideas and philosophies and policy and so much forevermore. I, I cannot thank you enough. Cannot thank you enough for being here on the More Confidence with Luna Gaia podcast. Just so you know, this episode today is coming out on Thursday, Thursday the 30th, the last day of September. It has just come out today, which means that tomorrow, tomorrow my debut book, Perfectly Imperfect, Your Complete Guide to Loving Yourself and Loving Your Body is going to be able to come out into your hot little hands. Super exciting. So actually what's going to happen between the hours of about 3 to 4.30 and 8.30 is five hours where the book is going to be able to be bought for 99 cents. So what I recommend that you do is get on quick as soon as the links go out. As soon as everything goes out, please jump on board. Buy your 99 cent digital copy, your Kindle book, the Kindle version of the book because holy smokes, you are never going to see it at this kind of prices again. 99 cents is an absolute steal even for the Kindle version. So please, between 3.30 if you're in my VIP group, 4.30 for everyone else, right through to 8.30, get on board it, get amongst it. And at 7.30 tomorrow night, I am doing my launch party, online launch party. We have amazing artists. I have a few poets, a viral TEDx speaker. We have we have Roshani. If you do not know who she is, go Google her, R-O-S-H-A-N-I. She's a phenomenal Australian artist with a, with a beautiful story. She's, they're all coming to hang out on, on, the, on the launch party tomorrow night where they will be performing some pieces. So get them. Get on board. Register. Everything is there in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here. I'm, I've been your host, Luna Gaia. Thank you so much for being part of the More Confidence with the Luna Gaia podcast. Until next time, happy self-loving. <laughs>